Hey everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, February 10th, 2013. I love Dylan. I really do. I was not expecting to feel this connected to his character so quickly, but I am. I love the guy. As the week started out, it was opening night, reopening night at the underground, and there's a huge line out the door. Tyler has done his job. Nick is very excited. Mac is behind the bar serving drinks, and we're just waiting for this moment when he comes face to face, finally, with Avery. Mac has got his lucky charm in his pocket, which there was a little backstory of he and Avery sitting on a bed and her giving him this rock that was just a kind of probably a boring, ordinary rock, but Avery saw something beautiful in it and she gave it to him and he has kept it for all this time in his pocket as his lucky charm and here it is his night the time when he, he's waited for years to actually see Avery face to face he's got the lucky charm in his pocket when she walks through the door now Avery has been the woman behind Nick throughout this entire disastrous club opening. And when she walks through the door, she naturally goes to her man. And she's hugging and they're kissing and she's there to congratulate and support him. And it's quite clear that they're happy together. Now, from behind the bar, Mac sees this and his hopes are instantly dashed. He realizes that she's moved on, he feels crushed, and so he leaves. He actually leaves the rock, his lucky charm, just sitting on the bar, and he runs away into the back room. He makes an excuse saying that he had an emergency and he has to leave, and he runs back into where the lockers are, and he's ready to go. He's ready to just throw in the towel. When Avery walks over to the bar, sees the rock sitting there, and now all of a sudden things are starting to make sense. There have been so many weird little reminders of Dylan in her mind from last week, the ripcord drink and the, you know, just all of these little things have started to come together and she sees the rock on the bar. She goes into the back break room and she sees him. She is shocked. For the first time, she's seeing a man who she thought was dead. And the, I have to tell you guys, the actress played it so beautifully. I was so impressed with her all week. You could really experience what she was going along through right along with her just by her body language. She was wobbly. And in the moment where she sees him for the first time, she drops her bag and kind of slunches over and you just realized how as she's looking at Dylan she is thinking that she's seeing a ghost. Can you even imagine thinking someone was dead and then seeing them again? Of course we've watched enough soap operas to where it's a little old hat. We've seen, we've seen that happen many many times. How many times has somebody come back from the dead? But Avery stood there stunned and beautiful, by the way. <laughs> I loved what she was wearing. She was in this dress with a sparkly, silvery top, and the bottom of it was just plain black, but she just she really stood out. Her golden, curly hair against the sparkly top. She looked gorgeous. She was the center of attention for that scene and that entire night, really. But Avery and Dylan have this brief moment together where she's stunned and he doesn't really know what to say. He is has, I think, on some level planned this reunion or always thought about this reunion and now here it is and he doesn't want to scare her away but and he doesn't want to smother her but I think he wants time with her. He wants time to explain but he didn't do that. That was what was odd about it. He 
was acknowledging, you know, he was giving her that, you know, yes, I'm still alive, let her have that moment, but he wasn't explaining. He wasn't saying, uh, it's, it's me, this is the terrible thing that happened to me, and I've been trying to get back to you. Like, that's what I would do. I would be all over that, but he didn't. They just had a, a, a brief, maybe a minute long meeting together, and he's wanting to, like, touch her hair, and she's touching his hand and, and asking herself, is this real? She's in shock, and Nick comes in. And the second Nick walks through the door, they stop touching and pull away. And Avery, her reaction, her instinct, is to act like she doesn't know him. They kind of hide it. They've had this realization, and now they're both hiding it. And I thought, ouch, that really had to her, that that was her instinct, was to lie and to kind of hide it. And I, from his perspective, especially, from Dylan's perspective especially, I thought, boy, that really had to sting. It, it wasn't as much of a happy reunion as you would expect. She felt torn. And I just thought the actress was so really good this week. She Avery had to spend the rest of of the night trying to act like this didn't just happen and she's sort of hiding her face and not really wanting to look anybody in the eye and not wanting anybody to see that she is crying and she didn't want to ruin Nick's night. She wanted to continue to try to be the uh, supportive girlfriend but inside she's dying. She's torn up. I mean her whole world has just been blown up and I'm thinking Girl, you need to just tell Nick right now. Just tell him what, what happened. That's the best course of action because, well, why lie? Why lie about it? If Nick is supposed to be there to support you and to be your partner, you should be able to tell him anything. And she didn't. She dodged for the rest of the night and after the party was over she let Nick take her home and she made kind of an excuse about not feeling well and just wanting to go to sleep and obviously just needing to get away from him and get some answers. She ended up going to see Dylan in his hotel room at, during the break, break room meeting. He had said, when can I see you? When can we talk about this? And he told her what hotel he was staying at. So she goes to see him. He opens up the door. And the first thing she does is smack him right in the face. Wow. I mean, I guess I can't blame her because he, like, didn't offer any kind of excuses right up front. He, from her perspective, let her believe that he was dead, didn't do anything uh, to, to try to contact her sooner, and now all of a sudden he's just showing up in her life right as things are starting to get on track for her. I can understand why she slapped him, although I felt really bad for him. I just, I, I thought, why, why is he not being open about what just happened? She thought he was dead. That and her pain and her aching was so real in that scene. She was crying and falling apart in a way that we've never seen Avery behave before. And it was just she was wearing her heart on her sleeve. And I loved it so much. I loved the actor so much. I had chills during that scene. And I felt really strongly from Dylan's perspective, too, that he didn't know how to tell her. And the only thing he really offered by way of an excuse was that he was injured. He was injured in combat or in Afghanistan or something. All he really has said was that he was injured. And I'm like, ah, how about the whole story, bud? I want to hear the whole story. Like, whatever happened to him, by this point, he's had more than one opportunity to tell the truth. And he's just not volunteering the information. The only other thing he said is that Avery and the thought of Avery and the idea of Avery is what got him through whatever it was that he went through. I don't know if maybe he was kidnapped, maybe he was a prisoner of war and therefore presumed dead and perhaps he was even tortured to some extent, that would make sense, and maybe that's something that he doesn't want to relive, uh, which is why he doesn't want to talk about it. Um, 
but I, I don't know. I, I, I will give him this. He's being really understanding, and I like the way he's handling it. He's not pressuring her. He had the opportunity, I'm sure, to just, he could have come back into town and been like, hey, baby, I'm back, and just scooped her up in his arms and acted like nothing ever happened, but that's not how he's playing it. He's being very understanding. He is not pushing her. He told her during that meeting at the hotel, I want you to have whatever you want, and if it's not me, you know, you kind of get the sense that he would be okay with that. So I like him. I like Dylan. I think he's a stand-up guy. And the next day, he even went to go see Nick. And of course, he wasn't sure if Avery had told him, and she did. Finally, um, you know, Avery goes back home after seeing Dylan. She gets a good night's sleep. Nick is showed up at the door pretty much first thing in the morning, and she does break down and finally tell him the truth. She says that she thought he was dead, and he's not, and that it was Mac. He told, she told, uh, that, that, that she told Nick everything. And then the next day, Nick is at the underground, and Dylan went to go see him, which I thought was an interesting choice. Dylan could have just disappeared off into the sunset, or he could have continued to pursue Avery and really not had much contact with Nick again, but he didn't do that. I thought it was a real stand-up thing to do to go to talk to Nick and give his side of the story, which is what he did. I mean, Nick uh, was very stern <laughs> toward Dylan. He didn't like being lied to. He didn't like being fed a line, and he certainly doesn't like that this guy is now coming back into his girlfriend's life. Nick has placed a lot of faith and a lot of chips on Avery for his future, and he doesn't like that now there is an X factor. And while Dylan is giving Nick his side of the story, Sharon is looking for Avery to do some business for Newman Enterprises, and because Avery has been so upset, she has not been into work. Sharon goes to visit Avery at her apartment, and Avery opens up to Sharon. So we're getting Dylan telling his side of the story to Nick, uh, spliced in with uh, Avery telling her side of the story to Sharon, and it was it was really good. I mean, a lot of the blanks were filled in. Avery said, uh, essentially, she was married uh, to this guy named Joe. He was all consumed in his work, wasn't paying attention to her, um, and so she ended up hooking up with Dylan, who was a contractor working on some something at her house. And at first they were friends, but they ended up falling in love, and long story short, he asked her to leave her husband for him. She said no, and so he left for Afghanistan, and from there he was presumed dead. Now the thing that I thought was most interesting about this was Avery mentioned to Sharon that the, I guess he was presumed dead only two years ago, which is really not that long. Obviously Avery is still holding on. She has his dog tags in her, you know, in her drawer. She didn't even, like, because she wasn't his girlfriend or his wife, she had to hear about it in the newspaper. This was a crushing blow to Avery. And only two years ago, that's really not very long for the, you know, the wound to heal. If this were something that happened ten years ago, maybe it would be a little bit different, maybe the pain would be a little bit more dull, but two years is is really, really nothing. Um, I think all of the wounds are still fairly fresh, and she's really going to have a decision on her hands. Now, Dylan wants her. He's not making any bones about it. He has mentioned to her that he still loves her, and he said pretty much that to Nick. And I thought that even Nick was being pretty fair. I thought Nick was fair toward Dylan, just telling her, you need to just give her her space. That's what I'm going to do. We're, neither of us are going to pressure her. We're going to let her have her time to decide how she needs to move forward. And I thought that the, the conversation between Avery and Sharon was really good, too, because Sharon said to her, you know, you, you need 
your time to figure this out. Sharon was being very understanding, just saying you need to follow your heart to decide what to do next. And if Avery doesn't decide to go with Dylan, I'm pretty sure that Sharon will take <laughs> will take him off of Avery's hands for her. <laughs> hmm. This is like at the club opening, and then again later at the coffee house, Adam met. Mac and I just kept thinking, or met Dylan and Adam. I just kept thinking, Adam, you've just met your competition, buddy. <laughs> hmm. I find it very, very intriguing. I feel like YNR is getting really good again because I've been very glued to my screen, especially for this storyline. I'm interested to see whatever he's gonna do. Clearly, she's confused. And she's being pulled in two directions, which is not going to get any better if if Dylan decides to stick around Genoa City, which we know he will. <laughs> she's going to continue to feel torn. And a couple of days of thinking about it is not going to make anything better. Avery is still working on this case for the Innocence Foundation, and she was called out of town for a court date. And she went to tell Nick that she was leaving, and she actually said to him, maybe it's for the best that we have, you know, this time. Which I thought was very odd. She, I don't know, that was an odd thing to say. Almost as if she's already disconnected herself emotionally from both men for a little bit so that she can make this decision. I, I'm curious to know who you guys would like to see her with. Are you, do you want to keep her with Nick? Do you think she's good with, with Dylan? Are you, I personally feel excited about the possibility of Avery and Dylan. I thought there was a lot of chemistry between them and I think that Avery and Dylan deserve a chance to see if their love could have worked out. Plus, with Avery's attention divided, it also gives Phyllis a chance to get her man back. Phyllis's outfit was amazing this week. I loved the way she looked. She was wearing this black kind of caplet jacket, had sort of a, a, a wide, long, flowy, cape-like sleeve, and she had a violet long sleeve blouse underneath it. It just looked good. The whole silhouette was rad. I thought Phyllis looked awesome. Really, less of Phyllis is more for me right now. There, We've been bombarded by Phyllis for the last several years, and she was really only in one or two scenes this week, and it was nice. It gave me a moment to appreciate Phyllis. Like, when she's not front and center all the time, I appreciate her more <laughs> when she actually is on screen. She's being there to support Jack and not getting up in anybody's face. I needed a break from all that. So, <laughs> Jack's drug dealer, Corey Feldman, <laughs> stops by his office this week. It's not actually Corey Feldman, but if you go back and rewatch that scene, Jack's drug dealer looks like Corey Feldman <laughs> to me. <laughs> but the guy stops by Jack's office and gives him a little baggie, a little sampler, a little classic drug dealer tip. I'm going to give you a taste, now, and then you're going to want more. It's his, his business, uh, business idea. And... Phyllis catches Jack sitting there with the bag, thinking about whether or not he's going to do it. Jack is still struggling with that addiction. He's clean now, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't want. And Phyllis sees him sitting there with the bag, grabs it out of his hands, is, is very mad at him, thinking that he has gone out and gotten this on on his own. And Jack you know, tries to explain exactly what happened, but you could tell there was some question in Phyllis's eyes. She didn't go through all of that with him just to now get to this place they are now and have him start using again. So I like that she is keeping him in check, and she did. She took the pills, she threw them away in the garbage can, and Jack needed that. He actually took a little bit of initiative after she left and called Neil into his office and asked him to be his sponsor. He said, I'm still not over this. I need someone close to me who is going to help, you know, help me to be able to talk about addiction. It's one thing to have support from someone like Phyllis, but being able to talk to someone who's been through it is, is 
precious is something that he needs and I like that it was Neil gosh Neil was a horrible drunk I hated those days Ugh, I will never forget those days it was dark 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 days for Neil and I like that Neil and Jack are being friendly especially because there's been so much tension between them as far as business goes and Jack really telling Nick Neil that he's got Jack telling Neil that he's got autonomy and then not really giving him autonomy and so that's been difficult and I like that they're developing a relationship even if it's over something like this. So that is very good and Jack and Phyllis's relationship is evolving. I just, I think she's using him. You can even tell they're out for dinner and she runs into Nick and she grabs onto Jack's arm, trying to play it up, I think, showing that, oh yes, well, we're together now. I'm fine, don't you know? I, I, I worry about whether or not that relationship is going to last, but we are finally getting to a point where we're seeing some more romance between them. It's not just desperation. So I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention and I'm willing to jump on board. Um, Phyllis stopped back uh, by Jack's office later um, in the day and she had a perfume sample from the guys down in R&D and they wanted, uh, they wanted uh, Jack to take a smell of it and rather than smelling it on a piece of paper, Jack put a little bit of it on her neck and he leaned in and smelled it on her. And I that that was a really nice touch. It was a slow, sweet scene, and it actually was very romantic. You know, t Jack talking about how a fragrance tells a story, and I I thought you know it tells uh, uh, that scene told a story about Jack's history. Jack's whole life could probably be told in perfume sense. As often as we see Jabot, we don't really get a sense of the product that they produce. And I really like that that was brought into the scene. I, I, Jack has probably smelled many, many, many scents. And I like that he, he put it on her and it gave me a sense of Jack's character. It made me feel connected to the family legacy. And he smelled the scent on her and he wanted to call it simply red. Or he was kind of going in that direction with it. And I liked the way he talked about the perfume and the notes that were in it. It, it was a slow build, uh, but uh, something that we needed, and I, I just thought it was really wonderful. Um, later, you know, she leaves, and he has roses sent to her house, <laughs> and the card on it said, thank you for saving my life. Of course, um, nobody mentioned that it probably also said, P.S. Please don't leave me for Nick again. We are starting to learn more about the mystery inmate that Avery is fighting so hard to get out of jail because he's been wrongfully accused and been sitting in jail for 12 years for a crime he didn't commit. Slowly, more of that information is starting to become unveiled. Congressman Wheeler has some sort of vested interest in keeping this guy in prison and he wants Avery to stop trying to get him out. So he stops by Avery's apartment this week and he actually was there under a guise. He said that whoever the victim in the case was, which I think had to be Tyler and Leslie's mother, he said that the victim was part of his campaign staff and so that's why he had a vested interest and he wanted to talk to Avery because he might be of help and you know he wants to he, he wants to help if some if, if he gave an incorrect statement at the time of the murder he wants to make sure that he gives the correct one and he acted like he wanted to help her but that's not the case he was clearly trying to trick Avery into involving him and he even asked her that as the case develops why don't you call my office and give information which is totally inappropriate. Why would Avery give information to him about the case? But the congressman did it in such a sleazy way that Avery, I'm sure, picked up on it. I'm sure she's just not going to fall for that. Something is fishy here. And then later, 
Congressman Wheeler goes to Jabot. I think he was looking for Jack. And he runs smack dab into Leslie. And he calls her Valerie. She lo he lo looks at her right in the face and says, oh, Valerie. And the look on his face was, was very interesting and very telling because he was kind of smiling. Uh, it didn't feel like it was awkward for him. For as much as Tyler and Leslie have been trying to run from this guy and make it a big deal, and Tyler last week trying to see if he recognized him, uh, it just seemed not awkward for the congressman. He was just like, hmm, he almost seemed kind of interested in her. She couldn't get away fast enough. <laughs> she practically ran, you know, turned around and ran the other way. She has obviously been living under an assumed name, or when she was working with Wheeler, whatever she was doing, she was using an assumed name there. I don't know. I don't know what the story is, and I don't feel any closer to figuring it out. I, the only thing I could think is I, the father is, what, is who's in jail, maybe the mother was the victim, and maybe Leslie and Tyler have been hiding to stay away from their father. Maybe that's their ultimate goal. I don't know. But... Victor is on the case. Never fear. Nobody worry about it. Victor is on the case. He's got a private investigator who is doing the research and following Wheeler around and providing reports to Victor. But when the PI doesn't really tell Victor exactly what he needed to know, Victor <laughs> goes on his computer and starts doing an internet search. As if... Google search is going to tell him everything he needs to know. Just just typing in Congressman Wheeler is going to give him information that the PI can't figure out. Like, this is Victor's bright idea. If the private investigator can't figure out all of the information that he needs to know on uh, <laughs> the congressman, the great Victor Newman is going to solve it all with an internet search. It's cool, you guys. I got this. I'll just do an internet search. <laughs> There's just something about seeing Victor on the internet that is hilarious to me. I don't know why. But Victor is there doing his internet search when he gets a pop-up ad for the underground grand reopening. I'm just imagining in, in Victor's mind, he was looking at it saying, how dare you pop up on me? Do you know who the hell I am? Have a nice day. Sharon brings Adam to the underground reopening. She practically had to drag him there. He really didn't want to go. He's not on friendly terms with Nick. And there was a little bit of question as to whether or not they should be seen together publicly. But everything went fine. It was actually really cute how Sharon ran into Mac again. She remembered his name and everything, so he's obviously made an impression on her. And it was cute to see her joking around with him again about how she spilled coffee on him and I'm very interested to see more scenes between those two but Adam and Sharon are totally working for me right now. They went to the club and ended up leaving and going to the athletic club er, er, later where Chelsea saw them together very, very awkward. She bolted really quick. She was like working on her drawings and stuff. Saw Adam and Sharon walk in the door and like ran away uh, it, it's, it's very, very over, it seems, for Adam and Chelsea. Although, I don't know. I don't know. Because there's got to be some kind of opening for Sharon and Mac. We all know that's going to happen. Sharon actually ran into Mac again the next day at the coffee house, and she put two and two together based on Avery's story that Mac was Dylan and that Dylan and Avery were connected. So that was very interesting. And I just like the vibe of Sharon right now with Mac and with Adam and with everybody. Sharon is being very, very fun for the first time in such a long time and it feels so good. I love seeing Sharon in charge, especially at the office. I think that Sharon is a very smart businesswoman. I think she's very smart without being a shark. You know, I think Sharon has 
an emotional intelligence about her that you know not a lot of people have. I think she has you know an emotional intelligence maybe even more so than a lot of the other characters on the show. She's very perceptive and she's very warm and she's funny and I love seeing this in, in charge, in command side of her. And I'm so irritated by Victor's meddling in her life. He, Victor thinks if he can bring Sharon down, he can bring Adam down, and it's very irritating. Victor summons Mason to come visit him, and Mason is such a brown noser. Mason shows up with Victor, and he's basically at the condo, and practically like a little lap dog. <laughs> what can I do for you, Mr. Newman? <laughs> I can't wait to, till you get back in charge, Mr. Newman. <laughs> gross, isn't it? I mean, he, was, he literally was like, I'm looking forward to you being back in charge. Like, ugh. Victor is using him so hard. In fact, I, I, as I predicted for like the last two weeks, Victor whips out a bottle of placebo pills and tries to get Mason to, to switch Sharon's pills as a way to bring her down. And the second Mason showed a little bit of hesitance, Victor whips out his large wad of cash and gives Mason a few bills and tells him to go about his business. I don't even know how anyone could be mean to Sharon. I don't know how Mason could even do that. Why would you even want to be mean to Sharon? For what? A couple thousand bucks? That's, I mean, so certainly we're not talking millions of dollars here. Victor had it in his wallet. Who would do such a thing? I'm actually very glad that Mason decided not to do it. He had an opportunity. He was in Sharon's bag holding the placebo bottle and her real pills bottle, and he decided not to do it. I'm so glad, because that would have made it really hard to ever like him. Mm. Plus, I just want Adam and Sharon to work. I just do. I don't want Sharon to go off the rails again. Adam needs Sharon. And on some level, I think she needs him. There's just so much forbiddenness <laughs> about them that I just can't help but want it. They are spending a lot of time together. Uh, Adam invites Sharon to his house for a business dinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now she's with him out at the house, I think trying still to encourage him to get back together with Chelsea. But the whole time there's that same ticking in the background and in, in, in the past that ticking seemed to represent that it was only a matter of time until Adam and Chelsea's marriage fell apart and now that ticking, ticking, ticking to me just says that it's only a matter of time until their reunion. There, there's just like so much tension between them and Adam just decides, you know what, I'm just going to cut the tension. He reaches over and just kisses Sharon square on the mouth. <laughs> just, I mean, they're talking about how, oh, this is a little dangerous. We really shouldn't be together, which is such foreplay. So he just reaches over and just kisses her. And she comes back with this stunned look on her face. I hope that they just decide to throw the papers out the window, the briefcases and all the proposals and whatever. Just throw it out the window and let's just get down to it and sleep together <laughs> uh, before we have to find out that Chelsea is pregnant again. Kate and Chelsea are pretty cozy for two people who don't really know each other. Kane is up in her business. He's asking her questions about her breakup with Adam. He's looking at her drawings, telling her how brilliant she is. And he's painting himself as this savior who's going to like take her to the next level. And he's saying things like, I believe in you. And we're kindred spirits. What? <laughs> He's talking about his kids, which I'm sure is reminding her of her kids. Like, what the heck is happening here? And why is it happening so quick? Like, Kane and Chelsea have developed this really close rapport out of nowhere. He is, like, 
going to bat for her hardcore when he does not know her. Like, he went to bat for her against Neil, okay? Neil is the head honcho of the new fashion division at Jabot, and Kane is underneath him. And Kane is off interviewing designers and stuff without really talking to Neil about it. Which, I can understand why that would make Neil upset. Neil and Kane have been butting heads for a while now, but then again, Billy was the one that asked Kane to go have the meeting with Chelsea. It's not like Kane went up there and came up with that idea on his own. And Neil is being real hard on Kane. In fact, Neil took Kane aside and kind of got all Victor on him. He actually ripped him a new one about going over his head and then left and told him to have a nice day at the end of it all. It was very odd. Very, very odd. And and even despite that, Kane seems to keep forging ahead, trying to get involved with Chelsea, even after Neil said no. Kane's going over to the old Restless Style building and talking to her about her drawings, and I really have to know what you guys think about this. Are you guys feeling a chemistry between Chelsea and Kane? Because I almost kind of am, and I'm mad at myself for it. I'm like, what, 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 what what's happening here? Like, I find myself going, huh, during the scenes and being interested, and then I pull myself out of it, and I'm like, wait, no, no, this can't be. <laughs> but I, I will just say this. I have not seen Kane smile that big in a long time. He's got some big old pearly whites that he's smiling with these days. And I almost wonder, with as irritated as Kane is with Neil and clearly kind of weighing his options and as interested as he suddenly magically is in the Chelsea and Chloe's fashion business, I wonder if Kane is going to quit at Jabot and go work with them. It's certainly a possibility, or maybe he's just going to keep it as his pet project, because clearly this is Kane's pet project. He has his pet project, and so does Lily, and his name is Tyler. And there was a awkward scene between Lily and Tyler this week where <sighs> Tyler's coming on to her. He is. I'm sorry. He's freaking coming on to her. And Lily, after having talked to Kane, kind of, where Kane kind of pushed her in this direction, Lily said to Tyler, I'm happily married. You know, if you're hitting on me, don't. And she tried to blow him off, and Tyler smoothed it out. He smoothed it all out real perfectly. Uh, but Lily shut him down. He was hitting on her, and Lily shut him down, and he still found a way to wriggle out of it and make Lily feel bad for thinking he was hitting on her, which he was. They had a brief little just conversation about romance and Tyler was asking questions about how she and Kane met and she was asking him questions about, you know, his dating life and Tyler revealed that he is not just interested in dating and sex. Like Tyler is looking for the one. And I'm pretty sure he thinks he's found her. And so the path to Fenn's redemption begins. Now hear me out. I have theories on this and I don't know if what I'm thinking is in sync with what everybody else is thinking, but Jamie is pressing charges against Fenn. And at the beginning of the week, Fenn is very, very flippant. He is not taking it seriously, not really believing that anything is going to come of these charges. And he is very bitter toward Michael when he realizes that this is not just going to go away. Michael's not just going to make the charges disappear because he is the DA. And there is a very intense scene between Fenn and Michael where Fenn confronts Michael about his past. And it was a bombshell moment where Fenn reveals that he knows his father has been in jail. He knows his father was in jail for attempted rape. And it's not pretty. That is not uh, a really something that you want your kids to know, of course. It's horrible enough that you've done it, and it's not something that you really want to be all over the place. And it, w it was odd because I guess 
I assumed that Fen knew. I, I don't know why. I just sort of assumed that it was known. I didn't realize that was going to be a revelation, but it certainly was. And it was a it was a bad. I mean, it was a good scene, but it was a bad uh, interaction between father and son. And Michael's been getting rough with Fen a little bit. Have you noticed? He's always grabbing him and turning him around and trying to say something to him. And Fen was getting up in Michael's face, too, even kind of pushed him a little bit, just sort of, like, touched his chest. It's it's uh, becoming a Victor and Adam-type uh, rivalous rivalry relationship. Uh, but I totally enjoyed it. I totally appreciate Michael's situation. Um, Michael tried very hard to explain to Fenn what had happened to him. He tried to set Fenn straight and let him know that his path wasn't an easy one. It wasn't that he was a bad guy and then he was another good guy overnight. Michael had to go through what he went through and had to struggle and make amends after amends to try to come out on top to, to become the person that he is today. And he doesn't want his son to have to travel that same path, to make the same mistakes and to go through the same hell. Michael sees in Fen's eyes that he is troubled and he wants to help him. He wants things to be different for Fen than they were for himself, which is really what any parent would want. But Michael is in this horrible position of now he's gonna have to uh, hear what Jamie has to say. A crime has been committed. J Jamie is is uh, alleging that a crime has been committed and Michael needs to take Jamie's statement as the first step. So they have Jamie over to Michael and Lauren's house, which I think is just, it was totally inappropriate. Like, I don't even know why they did that in the first place, but um, Jamie pretty much gave his statement and told everything we already knew. A lot of it was, um, you know, the it's everything we already knew. It was the text messages that Fenn was sending, the Brittany and Summer thing, he even named Summer. And at the end, was when Jamie just kind of revealed, and then he pushed me. You know, he, he he talked about the backpack being on the roof, and then just in the end, he pushed me. It was very detailed up until that point, and then it was just, he got this look in his eye like I was nothing, and then he pushed me. And Fen walked in while Jamie was making his statement. Which, again, another reason why it was totally appropriate to do that in Michael and Lauren's home. I mean, Michael had to practically throw Lauren out of the room before. Lauren it w was there, and she was begging the Jamie to tell the truth. And again, poisoning the well. It's just not, it wasn't right for her to be there. But now, Jamie has made his statement, and it comes to Michael for his choice. It's Michael's choice. And I guess my question for you guys is, does Michael really have a choice? He kind of has to do his job here. He, there's been, I mean, as much as I think Michael doesn't want Fen to go through the same thing, walk down the same path, he may just have to. Michael makes the decision to arrest Fen. Oh, and Lauren was watching in awe. She walked in as this was happening, as he's like, like Fen is getting his rights read. It was Oh my gosh, is what it was. Watching uh, the, the detective uh, you know, handcuff Fenn in his own home and lead him out, out the door to the elevator. Watching Michael on the other side of the elevator doors as his son is being hauled away. It was horrible. It was heartbreaking. And Lauren was looking at Michael like she could not believe what he just did. Like, it was Michael's fault that this was happening. She looked like she wanted to spit on him. It was disdain. Mm. And, okay, here, the, the thing is, Lauren is vehemently insisting on Fen's innocence. What, what she knows or not, she, she believes that her son couldn't have done this. And on some level to us, the viewer, Lauren is looking unreasonable. But she's right. I think Jamie is lying. I do not think, and have said this from the very beginning, I do not think that Fen pushed Jamie off of the roof. And here's why. Listen to me. Hear me out here. 
Number one. <laughs> Nearly 20 years of watching the show tells me that the main character rarely ever did it. It's it's very, very rare. <laughs> Number two, there was a conversation between Fen and Kevin this week that I thought was very, very revealing. Kevin is trying to steer Fen in the right direction, be the, you know, be the cool uncle helping him talk through these issues. And Fen confessed quite a bit of what had happened to Kevin. He confessed that he was the one that sent the texts and, you know, a lot about what he was feeling. And he even confessed to being on the roof with Jamie um, to Kevin. And what Fen said was, yeah, I was up there. But when I left the roof, Jamie was fine. And for the first time, it that planted a, a seed in, in my mind that wasn't there before. Kevin suggested that Jamie jumped off the roof, that he was going to commit suicide. And damn it, if I didn't have a realization in that moment, that is exactly what happened. And Finn had the same realization right then and there, realized that he had bullied Jamie to the point where he wanted to kill himself and he jumped off the roof and as he came to and sort of realized what was going on I think Jamie made the decision to pin it on Fen um, and I mean I don't like it I, I, I don't like that you know that is the truth but that is what I think happened I think that Jamie is lying and it's not because I think Jamie is a liar and it is certainly not because I think Fen is a great guy. I think that Jamie is telling one lie amongst a whole lot of truths. It's truth, 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 truth up until the end and then a lie. And you, even if you go back and watch him telling his statement, you know, recanting everything that had happened, it was very detailed and very heartfelt and emotional up until the point that we get to the roof. And it's almost as if, I mean, if you watch the line, he says something like, Fen just had this look in his eyes like I was nothing. And then he pauses and sort of comes out of it and says, and then he pushed me. And that seemed less fluid and more just, that's what I'm sticking to. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. I, I, I really think that that is the case. I'm curious to know what, what you guys have to say about that. I don't know if other people agree with me, if other people had that realization this week, or if I'm totally alone and everybody's going to disagree with me. I think that Jamie was tired of getting kicked around by Fen, as he should be, and just realized or figures that Fen has it coming to him and that Fen needs to learn this lesson. I think Fen will end up going to Juvie and he's going to get a taste of what Jamie has been through and it's going to turn him around. It is going to be the redemption moment for Fen. That's, that's, that's where it's headed. That's the arc. The bad thing is, I really like Jamie and I am worried that Jamie is going to end up coming off as the bad guy at the end of all of this. I am so heartbroken about what's going on with Nikki. I'm really not happy about this. I've been predicting for the last two weeks that it was that whatever was going on with her was something having to do with Victor's health and I, I think I'm very very wrong now and disappointed in that. I, my prediction is totally wrong. Something is wrong with Nikki. She went on this secret trip this week to Northwestern General. She played it off by saying that it had something to do with charity work, but she went to a hospital in Chicago, let's be real here, and she's trying to wriggle out of the wedding now. She's telling it to Nick and Victoria and Victor, and she's presenting it like, I just want to get married later, and I want to have more time, and I think it'll be more special if we do it when the ranch is rebuilt. And... It's so much worse than that. There was a scene where Nikki is at the condo playing the piano and she's having trouble with her hands. She plays for a little bit and then she pulls her hands back and kind of is, is um, wringing them back and forth as if she's experiencing some kind of nerve disease or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, 
it could be either of those things. Maybe it's a rare disease and that's why she went to a hospital in Chicago. I just hope that it's not something worse. Please, please don't tell me that the cancer is back. I do not want to go through a cancer storyline. I don't want to go through a sickness storyline. Can't this woman just be happy for a moment? And in other heartbreaking health news, Catherine is forgetting things. She's having trouble with her memory. It is concerning to her. It is concerning to me. She had the driver take her to a pharmacy this week where she got some herbal pills. I, Catherine is so pig-headed that she won't go to the doctor to find out what's wrong with her. She just wants to go to the pharmacy and try to get some herbal pills to take care of it. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't want to see, I don't want, I don't want to tear jerker in this way. I don't want to deal with health problems. It's so hard, it's so hard to watch. I, is it too much to ask for a little bit of happiness? <laughs> I guess so. At least Esther is there for Catherine. She, uh, Catherine has a lot of support, but I'm glad Esther is there for her. Although, side note, Esther, girl, it is time to retire the French made uniform. Okay, I'm not trying to be shady, but it is embarrassing. <laughs> it is, it's embarrassing. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> it was actually good to see Catherine get out of the house a little bit this week. She went to the coffee house and ran into Phyllis and Lauren and ended up having a good conversation with Lauren. That's what I like to see out of Catherine. I like seeing Catherine be the wise old owl. I like sage Catherine. I like her dispensing advice and telling people truths that perhaps they don't want to face. That's what I love about Catherine. And right now the character is way too isolated. Catherine needs to get out of the house more. Get up in some people's lives and get that brain working again. This week, Noah tells Adriana to take a hike. He is not interested in going off on some island with her. It's too much trouble. He gives her the bag of money and tells her to go. Meanwhile, Detective Chavez is chasing her around and finally they come face to face at the athletic club and there is this weird vibe between them where it just starts to seem personal, like they really know each other, like they're very, very comfortable. And Alex corners her and takes the bag of money away from her. And she starts to play this sob game that she does. Anytime she gets caught, she starts to say, oh, poor me, wah, wah, wah. And, start, and, and even like leans in to hug him. Next thing you know, she's got his gun pointed at him, says, give me the money. <laughs> and I can't believe I didn't see it before. I think that that was um, Tuesday's show. Uh, she points the gun on him, says, give me the money. He gives her the money and she runs away. And I realized in that moment, they're brother and sister. I cannot believe I didn't see it before. By the end of the week, it became totally revealed that they were brother and sister, and I was so mad. I was like, damn, I wanted to feel like I figured that out way sooner. <laughs> but that's the truth. Alex shows up to confront Noah after she runs off with the money. I don't know why he didn't go chasing after her. Instead, he goes and to Noah and accuses Noah of helping her, which Noah, in turn, turns around and accuses uh, Alex of being interested in her, acting like they were involved somehow, and that's when Alex confesses she's his sister. <laughs> Dang, I don't, like, the, I don't know why, like, Noah didn't figure it out. The last name would have been a dead giveaway, Noah. Like, is, is her name uh, Adriana Chavez, by any chance? Or I don't know if her having that bank account under a different name. Maybe that's her real name. Maybe her name is not Adriana. I have no idea. I don't know if Adriana is going to come back. I don't really care if she does. If now she's gone with the money, I could really care less. As long as we get to keep sexy Chavez. <laughs> mm, I really like Alex. 
<laughs> it has taken up until this week to for him to really sink in on me. I always thought he was sexy, but for some reason this week, the, I don't know if the actor is feeling a little more comfortable or if I'm feeling more comfortable with him, but he has come, he has become revealed to me in all of his sexiness. I freaking love him. I am so into him and I want him with Chloe. Please, please put him with Chloe. Like, why in our right now is breaking up couples that work, yet they leave Kevin and Chloe together? They are so boring and so over. Kevin actually suggested this week that he and Chloe burn down the coffee house for the insurance money, as if nobody was going to figure that out based on their financial situation. What kind of father is this? What kind of husband is this? He is over, I'm over Kevin. I'm certainly over him and Chloe. Er, Chloe actually rebelled against him, realizing that that was such a horrible idea. And she starts talking to Chavez in kind of a rebellious way and like starts flirting with him. It, I don't think she intended it to, for it to be as flirty as it was, but Chavez was like, let's go get a drink. <laughs> I'm totally into it. They have so much chemistry together. There's so much potential. Alex is like, he's so hot. I just want to like, I just want to lick his face. <laughs> he is like the new sex wolf for me. He's Ronan's replacement. He's like, I can't call him sex wolf though, because he's not really a wolf. I'm trying to think of what, what's a good like comparison for Alex. He's more like a... S sexy, spicy, sex fox. Okay, you guys. I hope that you enjoyed this week's show as much as I did. I'm, I'm totally into it. Loving the show this week. So much to talk about. I can't wait to hear what you guys are thinking. So please feel free to leave me a comment. Use the comment box below. Drop me all of your thoughts. I, I'm so excited to hear what you're thinking. I did a bad job of responding to comments last week because I was very busy, but leave me a comment this week and I will definitely be reading and responding. I hope that you guys have a wonderful Valentine's Day week. That you have lots of love from me. I love you guys a ton and I'll be back next Sunday to chat again about our favorite show. So everybody have a good week and I'll see you next time. Bye!